What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the 2023-2024 season finale of Studs and Duds, the most comprehensive NFL player review series on the internet. For those longtime viewers of the channel, I know you've been waiting for this one, so thank you for your patience. How this is going to work here for the finale, I'm going to be making eight of these episodes over the coming weeks, doing them four teams at a time by division as each division is fully eliminated from the playoffs. So we'll be getting through these in due time as the playoffs wrap up here. Um, but before we do get started, as always, I like to let people that may be new to the series know what Studs and Duds is all about. And what you may not know is back in 2016, this channel got its start actually as a Madden channel where I have a custom community roster where I go and edit the player ratings to be what are, in my opinion, more accurate and realistic. And then... You know, I'd come on here and talk about what I was seeing in the games and why I made those changes. And while I no longer make Madden content on this channel, I do still do some rebuilds and stuff over on TFG Plays, my second channel, if you want to check that out. I do still make that roster and this series because it's a great way for me to do my research and stay on top of everybody around the league, but it's also a great way to convey and take a wide lens look at who the rising and falling players around the league are, who's trending up, who's maybe not playing so well for every single player around the NFL. And throughout this video, you're gonna be seeing those Madden ratings going up or down. Um, but I do want you to know that those changes do a pretty good job to reflect how I perceive these players in real life. And the changes certainly stem from me watching the film and doing my own research and analysis. Uh, but without further ado, I hope you guys enjoy. Please do hit that like button as we get into it and let's get started. So first off, we have the Indianapolis Colts, who came oh so close to making the playoffs this year and what was a really impressive season. And uh, on top of that impressiveness is the fact that literally nobody is going down in terms of how we perceive them on this team, with the exception of the kicker, Matt Gay. Uh, but let's get into it. Let's start in the offense, where the star of the season is going to be. And again, this isn't necessarily like the team MVP or whatever. It's just whoever improved the most throughout the season. Um, and Bernard Raymond is going to be that guy. And uh, you could really have only hoped for this type of season from Bernard Raymond after he started poor in his rookie season of 2022, um, but finished strong at left tackle heading into the year. He was uh, a bit of a question mark, um, but really has settled in and gotten uh, firm control of how to play tackle in the NFL. It's both phases for him, too. He was a great run blocker at uh, uh, Central Michigan. That has certainly translated in this Colts run game. Um, but it is that pass protection that has been so impressive, improving his his anchor, improving his hand usage and all of that. Uh, they can feel pretty good about the fact that they have a franchise left tackle in Barnard Raymond, who I think is only going to continue to get better um, into year three here. And then um, Gardner Minshew is going to go up one now. I know he uh, didn't exactly show up when they needed him the most in that final game of the season against the Texans, but overall he played, I would say like one of the 32 best quarterbacks in the national football league and uh, set to become a free agent here this off season. You know, the Colts should feel um, very content with, with uh, Richardson coming back, but I am curious if there are teams that will look at what Minshew did and see him as a potential kind of bridge starter for them. I think he's played up to that level, and um, despite the way the season ended, uh, the final six to eight weeks were very solid for Gardner Minshew, and, and his ability to move inside the pocket and kind of feel the pass rush really is very like a very good trait that he has. He obviously um, leaves a little bit to be desired in terms of arm talent and accuracy, but uh, there's, there's definitely definitely like like high-end starter traits within his game um, but both these backup running backs are going to go up uh, it was really the Steelers game where these guys showed flashes you know Trey Sermon was a third round pick for the Niners who's been a complete bust to this point in his career but uh, you know showing showing that he still has some of that juice and 
you know, I'm not saying he's going to go and be a starter or anything, but I do think Zach Moss is set to be a free agent. And uh, I tweeted out all of the players that this team is going to be busy extending. I wouldn't be surprised if Trey Sermon is back as their RB2 with some of the flashes he's shown, um, along with Tyler Goodson. And again, I know I know that the way the season ended was not ideal for Gardner Minshew and Tyler Goodson with that brutal drop to end the game there on fourth down. But um, overall, Goodson... Uh, climbed up the ladder through the practice squad uh, after being an undrafted free agent for the Packers. Uh, gets brought in here in Indianapolis, had a couple games. That Steelers game had, I think, like 70 rushing yards. So, uh, you know, Sermon, Goodson, I think, are decent depth pieces. Uh, and I, I would like to see Goodson, you know, kind of bounce back from that last play of the game that really was not all on him. Minshew did leave it behind him. Um, then on the offensive line as well, Ryan Kelly going to continue to go up. He's really having a career year, man, after a couple down years at 30 years old. He's re-cemented himself as one of the better centers in the NFL, having a great year. Uh, lockdown pass protection in the middle of that offensive line, you know, calling the shots, picking up blitzes, all that good stuff. One of the more experienced centers in the NFL at this point in time. So that brings value, uh, but also kind of mauling guys in the run game too. So he's been outstanding. And then some of these playmakers, Will Mallory is one of the four tight ends that this team has really given significant playing time this year. He's a rookie out of Miami with incredible athleticism, and um, he's been able to translate those athletic traits into some productive plays down the field, some big receptions. He's grading out uh, probably better as a run blocker than you might have expected based on his Miami tape. So he's coming along in this organization that does a really good job with these athletic tight ends like Will Mallory. Um, and then these receivers, I just, I love this three set of skill sets here. You have kind of all three skill sets that you look for when you're trying to build, build a well-rounded receiving core. And with these three guys healthy into the second half of the season, they've all really clicked into their roles. And um, it hasn't been the most dominant group of weapons. Um, and in the case of Alec Pierce, who I'll talk about, you need to see a little bit more. But um, I definitely think they're hoping they can get Michael Pittman back, even if that's on the franchise tag. And then um, you have a, a really nice trio here with Downs, Pierce, and Pittman uh, getting Anthony Richardson back in here. Um, but from a more individual perspective, Josh Downs being that slot guy who, just like he showed at UNC, he has just rare hands consistency. So reliable. Just two drops on the season. The only other players in the NFL with more than 60 receptions and uh, less than a 3% drop rate include Justin Jefferson, Brandon Ayuk, DJ Moore. That's it. Oh, and Brandon Cooks had 61 receptions. So that's what we're talking about in terms of when he's open, you throw him the ball. He's plucking that thing, and he doesn't have some crazy big catch radius either, right? He's small compared to some of those names we just rattled off, uh, Brandon Cooks being the, the exception there, I suppose. But he's got the route running as well. He's shifty after the catch, really was a steal, one of the like easiest steal of the draft calls um, on draft day, and it's definitely proved out that way. He's been really solid. Uh, Alec Pierce, he's the guy that, really needs to take a big jump next year and it might even be to the point where they might invest in a different playmaker to kind of um you know create some competition here because um you know pierce has been very hit or miss but i do think with the way he's finished up the year with some explosive plays in there starting to play with a little bit more speed and confidence i think you can feel at least encouraged that he could be a wide receiver three for them as that vertical threat on the outside and then of course you have your ex michael pittman who is you know just had such a great year he's been the really focal point of the offense the engine of this offense the way that they can um, get him the ball uh, almost as a function of the run game with the slants and the rpos that they love here in indianapolis now with shane steichen um, he's another guy with crazy hands consistency he's super strong after the catch and what's cool about Pittman is um he is unique he's one of these guys where he's He's faster with the ball in his hands than he is within his routes and down the field. Um, it's hard; it's a hard thing to explain, but some guys are like that. You know, Debo Samuel is a good example of a player like that as well. But it really is a, a special skill set 
uh, within this this system here. And that's a big part of why they got to get him back. But he has shown some some nice plays, like on the outside. The contested catch rate is hung around you know north of fifty percent throughout his career. That's really good. Uh, it's what you're looking for in, in one of these kind of high end starting X wide receivers. Um, is you know we we probably overuse the term 50-50 ball um, because even the best X wide receivers in the league are you know winning 50-50 balls maybe 55 percent of the time. So you know Pittman has been reliable in that sense. So you know get get him back. I, I would love to see these three continue to grow together with their their future quarterback in Anthony Richardson. Um, but let's talk about the defense a little bit here with Gus Bradley, who it looks like he's going to be back as the defensive coordinator next year. Um, I do think he's doing a pretty good job with this group that I would not describe as the most talented defense in the league, especially in the secondary. But um, a lot of these guys up front have been really impressive. Uh, Both these kind of hybrid defensive end types kind of playing that Michael Bennett role uh, within this Seattle three style front here uh, where they're going to play on the edge on earlier downs and then slide inside of that kind of four eye three tech pass rush role on pass rush downs. Both Ode Ingbo and Taekwon Lewis have played excellent within that role. Um, so Ode Ingbo is going to get a plus two here. And I know Colts fans are going to say that's not enough because um, he registered double digit sacks this season, but uh, on just 29 pressures. So you project that forward. Um, you would never expect a player to get double digit sacks on just 29 pressures, but it's not to take things away from him. He has shown um, a ton of really ups side as a uh, interior pass rusher his quickness athletic ability paired with some of these pass rush moves the cross chops and the spin moves that he's putting on um you know you're you're, you're gonna say like okay maybe they let Tyquan Lewis go and next year could be a big year for Dio Odeng Bo I, I think the volume and um sample size still need to improve before you say he's a star uh, a kind of hybrid end, uh, but definitely impressed, and he's been much better than I ever thought he would be. This was not a player that I was particularly high on coming out, um, and uh, the Colts have made me look wrong for that one. So uh, he's going up, and then Taekwon Lewis is having a career year, man. He's a guy that does have uh, 44 pressures on the season. They brought him back on a one-year deal. I thought it was a sneaky good value to get him at that price point. Um, and and that I mean he's he's just a uh, a difficult kind of mismatch to handle from those pass rush alignments. Very Michael Bennett esque, uh, not quite Michael Bennett obviously, but the size profile is almost identical, like six four two seventy six. So that's a big reason he's having success here with the get off and the length and the power that he has. Um, I'm curious what they value him at because his production has been excellent um, for the Colts here. He's been a good kind of number three piece for this pass rush, um, but with all these pending free agents for them, um, he, he could prove to be a value for someone else. Some, uh, an interesting underrated name to follow heading into free agency here, uh, whether that's for the Colts or someone else. Um, and then Samson Abukum, talk about underrated free agents, man. This was one of the signings of the year. I'd probably put it right behind the Jesse Bates signing in terms of um, you know impact free agent moves the team's made. He's having a career year. He's been a just game changer for this this edge room that has been missing a guy like Abukum. They were hoping that Quiddy Pay would be that guy. He really hasn't been outside of one one outstanding game against the Titans offensive line. Um, But Abukum has been that guy all year, man. And it's not just the pass rushing where he's been that same guy he was in San Francisco. You know, putting his hand in the dirt, pile driving dudes, being an excellent problem on stunts and games that Gus Bradley likes to run up front, but his instincts and just overall tenacity against the run is special for a guy that isn't the longest or biggest edge player, right? He doesn't have the frame of guys like Lewis or Ode Ingbo, but he's he's probably a better overall run defender because he just knifes into the backfield and just I think he clearly does his film study and knows where the ball is going to go and how he can uh, make defensive stops in the backfield. So he's been such a good signing. And they still got him on the cheap for two years. So uh, credit to Chris Ballard, the GM here, for for finding him. And then this linebacker room has really had a nice season. Uh, EJ Speed just overtaking Shaq, Darius Leonard within this linebacker room to the point where they cut Darius Leonard. 
he is one of the more just yeah, instinctive, aggressive, fast to the ball run defenders that you'll ever see. He's just this highlight real waiting to happen. Such a fun player. He's got his deficiencies. He's not the most instinctive coverage defender, and he misses a lot of tackles because of his aggressiveness. But as a number two to Zaire Franklin, he's a ton of fun. I was really excited when they brought him back, and it's been really fun to see him kind of really overtake and outplay uh, Shaquille Leonard here. Uh, and then Zaire Franklin is kind of the mainstay here. These guys really play off each other. Zaire Franklin actually, I think, led the NFL in tackles this year. I think he got close to like 200 freaking tackles. It's insane. Um, you know, I will pound the table as much as anybody in that tackle numbers are incredibly overrated and probably the most overused, meaningless stat in all of football but when you have that many it's pretty damn stupid uh how consistent this guy has been around the ball and he's made flashes in coverage and he's just been kind of a good thumper in terms of run defense he's been a captain leader of that defense and i i again i don't think he's a superstar i don't think his raw tackle numbers make him that but when you compare him with a guy like EJ Speed, who can make some of those more splash plays, whereas Zaire Franklin can be the more disciplined guy, kind of let those tackles funnel to him a little bit more, uh, it clearly has worked out well for the Indianapolis Colts. And then you got Ronnie Harrison, who has really converted to linebacker for the Colts. Now it's that more either weak side backer in a base 4-3 front uh, where he's not really playing inside the trenches or he's coming down into the box being that kind of dime linebacker where you'll see EJ Speed come off the field. Um, but it's a really good role for Ronnie Harrison. And, and it's not indifferent from what he's done in years past with teams like Jacksonville and Cleveland. Um, he's been a true strong safety type, um, but he has kind of made that full conversion to just a, a, a linebacker in terms of positional listing here in this system. And in the last two months of the year, he played that role really well. It's a natural fit and he was a good pickup. I'll be curious to see if they value him in this role. Again, a pending free agent. They have a ton of work to do here, you guys. There's a lot of big names on this team that are pending free agents, but some, um, you know, kind of underrated role players as well, guys like Harrison and uh, Taekwon Lewis in that front seven. But then as you get to the secondary, much less to speak of, just not a lot of standouts, um, especially from the cornerback room from weeks 10 to 18 here. That's going to be an area that they have got to focus on. But the safeties have held up okay. Um, of course, Julian Blackman's had a solid season. Not going to go up for what he's done from weeks 10 to 18, but um, you know, another free agent that they've got to figure out if they're going to bring him back or not. Um, but Rodney Thomas, he hasn't really been good, but he's played and hasn't been a huge liability for them. Um, I don't really see him as a starting caliber player, but he's fine. I think deserves to go up a little bit here. Uh, but then Nick Cross, it's been really good to see him get on the field and make plays. I mean, it's about time. This is the back half of year two, and they just haven't really played him. Now, he was a super young 20-year-old uh, kind of traits-based developmental prospect when they took him. So it's not a huge surprise that he's only just now getting on the field. Um, but this would probably have been a plus three if he didn't possibly cost them a spot in the playoffs against the Texans with a horrible coverage that gave up a touchdown. Um, but uh, other than that, he's been really good. He's been coming downfield and tackling. He's played some free safety, some strong safety, a little bit of everything. Really special athlete. I would like to see him be one of their two starters on the back end next season and then as we kind of mentioned before we broke this whole thing down Matt Gay is going to come down a uh, big contract they dished out to him and that has been a mistake he's just been a very mediocre kicker not very good from deep this year so hopefully he can bounce back next year I guess next up we have the Jacksonville Jaguars who had Possibly the most disappointing season out of any team in the league this year, given their expectations. And with that, we are going to see some players falling in the ratings here today. But let's start with their star of the season on a good note. If you want one positive takeaway for the Jags, something to 
uh, hang your hat on and look forward to the future here. It is that they have unearthed not a star defensive player, a true superstar pass rusher in Josh Allen, whose steady growth throughout his career took maybe two extra leaps forward this year towards being genuinely a defensive player of the year candidate. What a just monster season from Josh Allen. 90 pressures, 19 sacks, and it's not even just the numbers. Anyone that watched Jags games, there was oftentimes throughout the season where you felt like if it wasn't for what Josh Allen was doing out there, this defense would have been dead in the woods. Just kind of putting this defensive line on his back at times. And that's what the elite pass rushers do. So uh, credit to Josh Allen, who has uh, gone up throughout the season. But really, as you look back on um, the whole year, seriously, it was right up there in terms of production with these, you know, defensive player of the year guys like TJ Watt, Miles Garrett, um, my, um, Micah Parsons was really punch for punch with those guys. And if he repeats this performance next year, um, you know, this is a guy with the athleticism, the draft pedigree, now the production profile. Um, he very quickly could uh, be someone that's consistently mentioned in those conversations. But let's flip over to the offense. And um, like I said, we're going to have some players falling here. And, and Calvin Ridley is going to come down again. Um, so many expectations for him coming into the year. And he just has not lived up to him, not to it. Now, now he was fine. He was solid. He had some big games throughout the season. But overall the lack of consistency from him specifically with his ball skills which have held him back from becoming kind of a true number one in years past in Atlanta um, but really felt like a problem this year it wasn't just the drops which were certainly an issue it was even more so just the kind of lack of football awareness that you feel watching Calvin Ridley whether it's not getting your feet in close to the sidelines not elevating and attacking the football, letting the football come to you. It's it's crazy how similar Calvin Ridley is to his Alabama successor is in Jerry Judy, who has the exact same issues where he's a phenomenal route runner. He can get open and he's going to see a lot of targets down the field because of that. But just the inability to consistently bring the ball in is extremely frustrating. Jacksonville actually has an incentive to let this guy walk in free agency. Um, they obviously would have to replace his production, but I, I'm very curious to see how they handle that situation. Um, and it's, again, it's not that he sucks. It's just that they they really thought he could step in and, and kind of be like their their DJ Moore acquisition, almost their A.J. Brown acquisition. Um, and he, he really wasn't. Now, on the offensive line, they do have a lot of work to do, but the right tackle Anton Harrison, first-round rookie, uh, I do think really got better as the year went on. Had a lot of just games in pass protection where you just didn't have to worry about them. Now, when they went against the Ravens, when they went against the Browns, um, he definitely had his hiccups, some great pass rushes there, and, and he still has plenty of room to grow. Just as we knew he would coming into the league, he was he was definitely, I'm not going to say he was raw, but certainly a tackle that you wouldn't expect to just step in and be dominant right away. But, you know, five, six, seven really good starts down the stretch. And uh, it, it definitely trending in the right direction. Athletic guy with a lot of upside, so you'd certainly like to see that at the end of the year. Um, but the rest of this offensive line, it, they just have a, a ton of questions, especially on this interior. You know, they they have Brandon Sheriff there, but he's getting up there in age. Center, still not getting a ton there from Luke Fortner. And then this left guard spot's going to be a huge question mark for them. Um, they were hoping that Ezra Cleveland could step in and, and be an answer for them. They traded for him midseason from the Vikings. Um, we talked about the scheme change when he came in here, where it was like, okay, on one hand, the Vikings kind of wide zone blocking scheme probably protected Ezra Cleveland as a pass protector quite a bit, whereas you did see a lot of frustrating one-on-one -on -one losses from Ezra Cleveland, even in Minnesota. Um, additionally, the run blocking scheme is a whole lot different here in Jacksonville. This is much more of a north and south run game a lot of those shotgun you know inside zone powers type schemes whereas minnesota is that wide zone shanahan style base where ezra cleveland's such a fantastic uh athlete moving sideline to sideline so just a very different scheme change it really did not play well for ezra cleveland i think as he heads to free agency i think i mean jacksonville i think is not going to resign him based on how he played he's going to come down three here in studs and duds but as we look at ezra cleveland i do think he can be an answer 
for a team like, you know, San Francisco, the New York Jets, the, the Green Bay Packers, like something like that where he's going back to one of those uh, more Shanahan base offenses, um, Houston Texans, like something like that. But I think we learned a lot about kind of his lack of play strength and, and really needing to be kind of one of those scheme-specific types of guards, uh, which is is not unfamiliar in the league. So Jags have a lot to think about with this offense, uh, helping Trevor Lawrence get some more help. Um, but the, the defense as well really fell off in the, the last kind of quarter to third of the season here after a really strong start. Now we are going to see some more guys going up with the edge group. Um, granted, these are two first-round picks that, you're definitely leaving wanting still more from, especially Caleb on Chesson, who, look, it's just a plus one here. I'm not going to rave about the guy, but he's actually gotten some playing time and hasn't been a constant liability as he's been in years past. Um, he's probably due for a change of scenery here heading into year five. And then we have Trayvon Walker. And th this is going to be a mixed conversation because I do want to start by saying he has gotten better in year two. His pass rush productivity is up. He is actually 23rd in the NFL in total pressures. He had the double digit sack season. Um, so he is showing growth. Um, now, the context always has to be considered here. This is the former number one overall pick in the draft with freaky athleticism that I think is also a lot of Jags fans are gonna expect to see a bigger boost here for this player after he did have double digit sacks. Now, we have way too much good information nowadays when it relates to pass rushers to just look at those sacks. And it's not just the stats either. Like you watch Jags games and it's much more just splash plays from Trayvon Walker than it is trusting him to show up and dominate in a big spot and that's reflected in the fact that he's 68th in the nfl out of 122 pass rushers in pass rush win rate now it's not terrible um, but when you talk about a guy that did get double digit sacks that does have all these expectations you certainly just you want to see that jump up a good bit you want to see him start to bring some more of a pass rush profile to the table so that you know, it's not just pushing the pocket and winning on these stunts and, you know, ripping to the corner where where that's good and that's great and you can you can get some wins off of that. But um, there's just a lot more growth to go with Trayvon Walker. I would still stand here and say that that was a poor draft pick, just as I did at the day that it happened. But it's not all negative either. Like, you're seeing some of that steady growth. There's still room for him to take a massive leap. Like, if he can have the leap Josh Allen had, um, I mean, you're really in business. But like I was saying earlier with Josh Allen, like there were plenty of games where he, he just he vanished. He disappeared. And the other thing um, is the, the idea was he was supposed to be this elite run defender uh, while he grows as a pass rusher. And that just hasn't been the case. He'll, he'll certainly splash into the backfield, um, make some big stops. But that is few and far between relative to what you really hoped. So it's a, it's a nuanced conversation. Uh, hoping for a big year three now from from Trayvon Walker that could really mean a lot for this defense. Um, now the, uh, the another edge here, Dwayne Smoot is going to go down. He started the season injured, and I don't know if he was playing through injury or not. But um, we saw a long period of games from him. Really, the last kind of two thirds of the season he was out there, and and this is a player that's been productive for the Jags in years past. Um, not so much this year, just really struggled to hold up as a run defender, uh, wasn't winning as a pass rusher, certainly a concerning year for, for Smoot. But the Jags are seeing some pretty good returns from Devin Lloyd, who they spent a first round pick on, has really taken a step up here in year two. I, you know, for those Jags fans, obviously remember, but those that um, have followed the situation. Like, he did not have a good rookie year. He was benched at times for Chad Muma. He was missing a million tackles, which was a concern of his coming out of Utah. But he's really settled in and uh, been a nice player here. Cut that missed tackle percentage down about four points. Um, he, he had about 50% more defensive stops, so seeing the ball better, getting up to the line of scrimmage, making plays. He ended up second in the NFL in pass breakups as well. Um, oh, and he missed a couple games, second behind Quincy Williams. And uh, Lloyd's an interesting coverage player because he's not a great athlete, but he's incredibly heady. He's kind of like Fred Warner if he wasn't a great athlete because he's kind of lanky and smart and drifts uh, to the right spots in, in those zone drops. Um, so he's just kind of week to week because you can get him matched up on a crossing route or man to man, and uh, they're going to take advantage of you. 
and like that play against the Niners where he ended up having to run down the seam with George Kittle. Like, good example there. Like, he's not a perfect coverage player, but uh, he is a productive one. So, he, you know, he's he's really rounded out his game and is a nice running mate to uh, Foy Setaluakun as well. So, uh, good year for Lloyd. And then as you go to the back end, Antonio Johnson started to see a lot of snaps in the last kind of six weeks of the season. And uh, he was doing a lot of what he did at Texas A&M, which is cool. So he's he's a really unique prospect. 6'2", 195 pounds, was listed as a safety, but he really played slot corner, kind of that, that star safety position, which is effectively a slot corner. Uh, he played that at Texas A&M, and he played it really well. But we weren't really sure for a guy that's kind of stiff and lanky and a slow accelerator at times if slot corner was going to be his position in the NFL. Well, the Jags seemed to think so. And he ended up playing kind of a rotational slash quasi starting role, getting, you know, anywhere between 20 and 40 snaps a game um, in their in their nickel looks. And it was just really sound. Didn't give up a ton in coverage. He did have a nice pick against um, Bryce Young and the Panthers. He actually ended up with two interceptions on the season. Uh, one was coming in in his one snap played for a Hail Mary against the Steelers. So take that one with a grain of salt. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see if he's their starting slot corner next year. If he's an Antonio Hamilton type of role. I don't know, but uh, definitely someone to keep an eye on. A, a prospect I liked that... I don't really know why he fell to the fifth round. I think I had a second or third round grade on the guy. I thought he was a total steal. So um, good to see him get out there and, and, you know, only 170 snaps on the season. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll see, man. We'll see. Uh, and then, unfortunately, Tyson Campbell is going to come down, just did not follow up really, a, I would say, a Pro Bowl caliber season um, in, his, in his second year of 2022. Did not follow that up with really a good year at all. Did did miss some time for injuries, but w- was just a guy out there. He was he was a jag, uh, just a guy. <laughs> um, but man, gave up eight touchdowns on the season. His best game of the year was Week One against the Colts. Um, second best game was also against the Colts, probably. Um, so that's a good matchup for him. But other than that, was really getting picked on. I mean, he gave up almost 500 yards in 11 games. That's that's quite a bit, not to mention the eight touchdowns, three penalties. So just, just a really rough year for Campbell, who's going to head into a contract year next year. If you're looking for this Jags defense to take a, a leap and really help them next year uh, as they are going to move to a, a different defensive scheme, you're looking at a guy like Tyson Campbell, where he had this great year in 2022, a, a really bad year in 2023, you know, him having a kind of reemergence in a contract year would, would go a long way uh, for this Jags defense. Then next up, we have the Houston Texans. And this I'm just so excited to talk about this team. I'm so excited to see where this team is heading next season. So many big names at impact positions going up here throughout the season in this episode of Studs and Duds. Like, you name it. And of course, the star of the season is going to be C.J. Stroud, uh, because I think if I didn't make it C.J. Stroud, you guys would be coming for my head. But the reality is there are so many candidates that could be highlighted for just incredible growth um, based on how we perceive these guys coming into the year. And of course, C.J. Stroud coming in as a rookie is one of those guys just stepping in and really just from the outset looking like a veteran quarterback. There's so many different aspects of his game and compliments you could give to cj stroud but i think that's the first thing you gravitate towards just the ability to handle things at the line of scrimmage to handle the blitz to avoid mistakes and just know where to go with the football you pair that then with incredible accuracy and then everything we've talked about um just with the whole like georgia game cj stroud thing where one of the questions on stroud coming out was how well is he going to kind of extend plays and handle pressure and navigate the pocket and you know he has that georgia game and he looks great at it and it was not the same as the rest of his games at ohio state well again you can reiterate that point he has throughout the course of the season just been so consistent in terms of pocket presence and playing under pressure. You look at some of those throws he made against Cleveland where the blitz is in his face or he's just kind of 
having that natural drift away from the pressure. It's it's all there with C.J. Stroud. It's been so fun to see him uh, thrive, win a playoff game, and uh, this is really just the beginning for him. So um, we're going to start there, but we've got a lot more positive things to say about this offense. Um, Devin Singletary really kicked it up in the second half of the year after in the first two episodes of Studs and Duds, we actually lowered him. He did not look like an impact signing for them, um, but man, uh, they really needed him as uh, Damian Pierce just struggled to kind of, you know, stay healthy and be that dude this year. In fact, we could argue that we should lower Damian Pierce. We'll kind of see what he looks like early next year. Um, I just don't think he was healthy this year. Uh, let me know in the comments down below what you guys think about that one. But um, in terms of Singletary, uh, he got right back to being what was, in my opinion, a very underrated running back in Buffalo and an underrated signing by this Texans front office. And, and they really needed him. He had some huge games. I mean, he was a big part of that Browns win. Uh, they just couldn't get him on the grounds. Had, had explosive runs. Uh, was consistent in the receiving games. So, uh, you know, he's been a, a mainstay for them in the second half of the year. But then these wide receivers, man, both Nico Collins and Tank Dell, what a huge part of this team's success this season. And obviously Tank uh, wasn't able to stay healthy down the stretch. Uh, they're hoping to get him back. But, but Nico Collins, let's start with him. I mean, he was legitimately one of the best wide receivers in all of football this year. He had uh, almost 1,500 yards, nine touchdowns, was really good in contested catch situations. And that's maybe what you could have thought for a bigger bodied six foot four wide receiver kind of reaching his upside. I mean, obviously that wasn't expected of Nico Collins, but what I'm getting at here is what, what is unexpected for Nico Collins is the run after catch 22 missed tackles forced uh, on the season. He had 646 yards after the catch. Not to mention the route running at his size and his ability to just dominate on those inbreakers, where he is such a perfect complement with CJ Stroud, who sees that part of the field and um, can throw those inbreakers with accuracy and anticipation. I think that's the biggest area where you would say Stroud is elevating Nico Collins to that level. Um, but Nico Collins playing really at an elite level this year, especially at the way he finished the season. Once Tank Dell went down, he really kicked it up. I mean, he had what 450 yards in the last and, and like 30 touch, uh, 30 reception, not 30 touchdowns, 30 receptions, 450 yards about in the last month of the season. I mean, that's just incredible. I'm very curious to see what him and his agent and the Texans kind of decide here because he, he definitely could get paid off of his performance here. Um, but you know, that might be kind of like. 20 mil a year uh but nico collins could kind of bet on himself here and say hey i've got all the skills let's come back let's repeat this thing and if he repeats this type of season he's going to be a 30 million dollar receiver like he really is playing at that level despite the fact that he was a third round pick it doesn't matter he's got all the athletic tools and size um if he repeats that type of performance to really get up and be viewed as one of these premium you know top premium wide receivers in the league um, but Tank Dell, God, it's just so fun, this Texans team, man. They're so well-constructed. Everything makes sense. Tank Dell being a complete opposite skill set to Nico Collins. I just hope he can get back um, healthy and, and to the level he was playing at. But I, I think, honestly, Tank Dell um, is the tape that he put out there. He's already one of the best separators at the position. And the route running and the speed and the quickness and all that – was evident on film and at the senior bowl where he just stole the show the question was will he translate at that size at 5 8 165 pounds i mean tank as his name and nickname couldn't be any more um hilarious when you think about it uh but man it did it translated at that size and when you have a player that that's kind of the question is is will the size play in the NFL and really you don't have any questions about his skill or his athleticism, you know, when that translates right away, there's no reason to believe that that won't sustain. So really excited for Tank Dell as that perfect compliment to Nico Collins being that kind of speedy separator speed route running type. It's, it's, 
it's really setting up well with these two guys, and there's plenty of reason to be excited uh, for both these players. Um, now, Robert Woods, unfortunately, just is not really that guy anymore. Injuries, age, the regression, um, the inefficiency from him. He's still a reliable, like decent wide receiver four or five, um, but just he's not a, I don't even think really a, a quality starter or anything close to that. Uh, these days, just not, you know, his yards per route run has dropped down significantly uh, year by year from the the player he was, kind of back with with those good Rams teams. Uh, then Brevin Jordan gonna give him some love for that huge touchdown he had against the Browns, outrunning the whole Browns defense. Uh, hasn't played a ton because Dalton Schultz been uh, such a big part of this um, offense, but uh, just good to see the the playmaker making some plays. He's it's not the only time he showed up this year. Uh, and I think as that kind of wing tight end two playmaker, he's a he's a good player for what he is. Uh, so giving him a little respect. Uh, and then, you know, honestly, the offensive line, not a ton of love to show there. That, I think, is going to be their main focus along with the secondary this offseason. Um, Michael Dieter did step in about midseason and started at center. He's got a lot of experience. He was fine. He had some hiccup games uh, like that Jets game uh, where, you know, he's going up against great um, great matchups and they got the best of them, but he held up okay at center. He's going to get a little bit of love, um, but I don't think he's the long-term answer or anything like that. They they definitely have work to do with this old line, uh, but they got bodies in there and guys coming back from injury like Kenyon Green and um, Kendrick Green. <laughs> two, those are two different players, by the way, with potential. Uh, they have Titus Howard, who I think you kick back to right tackle. Juice Scruggs had to play guard. It didn't look good. Uh, could he he step up at, in center, at, at, uh, at center in year two? They have bodies, but I still think you invest there. Um, but, yeah, let's let's talk about the defense that has had a, a almost equally positive trajectory here. You do have, like Robert Woods, some of these veterans that are getting some age regression here, but plenty of guys stepping up behind them. Um, so on the defensive line, Khalil Davis, uh, the draft Knicks will remember Khalil Davis from, I think, the 2020 draft. Him and his brother, uh, Carlos Davis, both out of Nebraska, just freaky athletes, but very raw, unproductive players. And Khalil Davis has bounced around. He was drafted by Tampa. Um, I think spent some time in Indianapolis. Uh, but getting to come here with D'Amico Ryans and this, this coaching staff, he has emerged not as a superstar or anything, but as a really nice rotational player. And he ended up like 20 something pressures, a decent chunk of run stops and um, just a good rotational defensive tackle, potentially reaching his upside here with this excellent defensive coaching. Um, then you go to the edge group. This, this, uh, collection of edge players really kicked it up in the second half of the season. I mean, Will Anderson was uh, solid to start the year, but felt like he really settled in down the stretch. And we gave Anderson a plus one um, in the last episode of Studs and Duds that ended off, I think, like after week eight or week nine. Um, but getting a plus five here. I mean, he's heading towards uh, superstardom, which we know is in his potential. He was uh, one of the blue chip prospects in this draft class. And they obviously made that big play to go get him. Uh, certainly living up to his hype. He ends up with 68 pressures, eight sacks on the season was 17th in the NFL in PFF pass rush win rate come season's end. So um, really started to get comfortable. And uh, I think this is just the beginning for Will Anderson, but certainly exciting to see. You know, it's not everybody hits the ground running like that, even these top drafted guys. So um, just so much excitement there. And then you've got a number two guy in Jonathan Grenard, opposite of him, who, you know, he's not the most incredible athlete, and I think sometimes his games are very week to week. Like, he definitely stalled out against Baltimore, and he has these games where he does kind of just disappear. So that's where I'm a, I'm a little bit skeptical of, like, is he a true number two, or is he, like, the best number three in the league? I think next year we'll find that out. He is a pending free agent. I think they try to get him back based on what he did this year. Ended up with double-digit sacks and, and some huge performances in there. He is a guy that can win with power and win with some different um, finesse pass rush moves. But, yeah, we'll, we'll see what um, kind of contract he gets and if he can uh, keep it up because he's been a very just up-and-down player throughout his career, but I really like what we saw from him and uh, optimistic that he can be a number two opposite of Will Anderson. Uh, and then they picked up Derek Barnett, another guy that we'll see what his kind of future holds here. 
Uh, but a former first round draft pedigree didn't really play in Philadelphia ends up getting let go there and Houston's like yeah we'll take him uh, and he played really well now just a plus one here because his three monster games came in two performances against the Titans that had a laughing stock of an offensive line um, and another one against the Browns who had uh, a couple of backup tackles in there that was that first game uh, that the Texans had against the Browns and in those three games uh, he ended up with 15 pressures and three sacks uh, but they definitely got something from him. Good to see those signs of life, even if they were against favorable matchups, and maybe have has made himself some money here heading into the offseason uh, after being kind of a castaway. Uh, then you get to the second level. I think you're excited about these linebackers. Uh, we are going to drop Denzel Perriman on the other side of 30 years old now. I've always been a Denzel Perriman fan, and I think he's still underrated. Uh, but that said, he had a down year. Just um, The last two years really has missed a concerning percentage of his tackles up there at uh, 15 percent this year that's a lot um you know 2020 2021 i thought were kind of the two best years of his career he was down at about six and seven percent the last two years he's he's been missing about double that so to see that last year with more missed tackles was not an outlier uh is a little bit concerning there but beyond that i mean i've never viewed him as a great coverage player uh, but he did give up twice as many yards in coverage this year per PFF uh, than he did the year before. Uh, granted, he picked up three pass breakups there, so I don't think he's a huge problem in coverage, but certainly uh, not a great year from him. Either either way, um, I think just a uh, minor, minor drop here is fair, uh, but still, I would say, an underrated player uh, and should be starting somewhere. But I don't know that he'll be back and starting in Houston because of the way these two young guys have played, both Christian Harris down the stretch and Blake Cashman really all year long. Two remarkable athletes, good prospects coming out of college, in my opinion, um, now, Cashman, it's just a matter of health, right? He's been awesome all season long, super consistent in every phase of the game. What a find he's been, um, and I think getting some development as well, getting to work with D'Amico Ryans. Um, but he's he's awesome. I hope he's starting for Houston next year and continues to uh, kind of cement himself as this kind of ascending mid-career breakout that he's been um, but then Christian Harris this one makes total sense right I, we said this coming into the year Christian Harris now in year two getting to work with D'Amico Ryans with really a veteran group where he had to earn this opportunity um, and as the year's gone on man he has flourished in many phases of the game he's been flying sideline to sideline racking up tackles making run stops he's been an impact in coverage um, and then uh, the blitzing that has really come on for him. I mean, he is a freaking rocket launcher of a blitzing linebacker. I mean, this is a guy that's basically a safety playing the linebacker position that's put on a little bit of weight and uh, kind of learned that position. But in terms of like what he was as a high school recruit and um, what his physical profile is, like he's a safety that's learning how to play linebacker here. And uh, it's it's all coming together. And, and the coolest thing is that clip that came out from D'Amico Ryans and Christian Harris, where D'Amico's literally breaking it all down for Christian Harris. He's like, just read Flacco's eyes, just sit on it, the ball will come right to you. Um, and then for Harris to take to that coaching and execute on the field. Um, I think we're starting to see the very beginnings of a special player. Um, this is the exact type of linebacker. Um, that I always talk about, like third, fourth round, if there are super athletes there and you have the right development plan, these are the kinds of guys that can be your Fred Warners, your Dre Greenlaws with this San Francisco staff in place here in Houston. So it's just another echo of that point I've made in terms of draft philosophy, but it's been in play here for Houston. Love to see those two guys. Would love to see this be a nice one-two punch for them next year. Um, then you get to the secondary. I said earlier, I think they have some work to do. It was a lot of veterans uh, playing in this room that I think this is the spot that you want to get younger and faster at, uh, but I think you feel very good about Derek Stingley. He's not Sauce Gardner, but he is his own player. And what a year it was for Stingley. Racked up a bunch of interceptions. Granted, some of those fell in his lap. But um, what's more more important to see is the down-in, down-out coverage consistency. And as he got healthy and got to play with more confidence, they started to shadow him around the field. And, and he had some awesome performances. So, uh, yeah, I mean, Stingley was a top 
three pick for a reason. He's incredibly talented. He's super instinctive uh, and a really good cover corner. So uh, how could you not be excited for his future? Just again, you know, him and Cashman, these guys just got to stay healthy, man. Um, But huge year for him. Um, And then one more veteran, just kind of seeing some do regression here. Jimmy Ward. Um, I think he's just slowing down a little bit, you know, 32 years old. He leaves San Francisco, gets a contract that was a lot less than you kind of expected. It was kind of the early signs of like, okay, maybe the league is a little bit lower on what they're seeing from Jimmy Ward and uh, definitely a down year for him in terms of just coverage production um, and, and consistency. He gave up a lot more in coverage. Wasn't quite that impact player he was for the Niners for all those years. Still a good player, still an incredibly consistent tackler coming downfield. Um, and they need that after what we saw from a lot of these guys in that Ravens game. But uh, yeah, you're, he'll, he'll be back one more year. And then I think that that might be it for Jimmy Ward um, at 33. Uh, but yeah, I, I do think it had to come down. But overall, man, how fun is this Houston Texans team? And the rest of these teams in the AFC South, I think, are um, shaking in their boots knowing not just Stroud, but I mean, the, the players that we are raving about here wide receivers, edge rushers, corners. Like, that's how you really win in the NFL. And then we finish up with the Tennessee Titans. <laughs> they got work to do, man. And I struggled to really pick a star of the season. I don't know that they had a highlight player here. Um, but I will pick Ty J Spears, the third round rookie running back out of Tulane who, with Derrick Henry given, you know, goodbye speeches in Nashville in the final game of the year, with the way Ty J. Spears played this year, he definitely looks like he's ready to take over as the lead back in Tennessee next year. And that's really exciting. As of now, like super knock on wood, all of those reported injury concerns about him uh, have not surfaced. He got through the entire season and was really good from start to finish. Now, from a rushing productivity standpoint, it was tough behind this Titans offensive line. There's no denying it. Derek Henry himself struggled to have good games behind the run blocking that was in place in Tennessee. But even then, Ty J. Spears had 450 yards on 100 attempts. That's good for 4.5 per attempt for those that are good at math. Um, But really elusive on those touches. I mean, 26 missed tackles forced on 100 attempts. That's awesome. Um, But on top of that, it was what he did in the receiving game, where he was a constant weapon for them. 52 receptions for 385 yards. Again, split in time with Derrick Henry, who had a decent chunk of receptions himself. So uh, the pro comp for Ty J Spears was Aaron Jones coming out. And honestly, with how he's looked here as a rookie, you can see why. Um, He really, I think, has a chance to be an Aaron Jones level player. And that's really saying a lot. Definitely needs some more help in front of them with the run blocking here, but uh, definitely talking myself into saying he is a worthy star of the season, uh, getting another plus two here heading into his second season. Um, but then the quarterback, Will Levis, is going to go up another one here. I think, you know, the, the best thing you can say about Levis is he just he looks the part in a situation that he, no one really has any business looking the part. Um, but his arm talent and honestly, like, processing and ability to get the ball out to the right spot was pretty damn good for a rookie who's out here in an offense that it's it's DeAndre Hopkins or bust uh really um and then an offensive line that was one of the worst in the league I mean you could see that Levis was a guy that dealt with similar circumstances in Kentucky and and he had a pretty damn solid rookie season some big games out there had some imperfections as well um I don't think even the big Will Levis truther like myself would say he's cemented himself as a franchise quarterback, but he is undoubtedly going to be their starter next season. And with uh, Coach Callahan coming in now, uh, you know, different system and and kind of getting to pair him now in what will effectively be his rookie season with a new offensive coach. Uh, very excited to see how that goes. Um, but as we look at the rest of the offense here, I mean, they just they have work to do, man. Like I said, I mean, we're going to get some small risers here, but no impact players really going up here in Tennessee. Josh Wiley was a mid-round rookie tight end, did make some really impressive catches using that six-foot-seven frame of his uh, this season. Uh, Not much 
to really add on top of that. I don't really see a full package of a tight end there, but as a, um, as what I like to say is a uh, smash and cash tight end too, where he can be a, you know, maybe take some strides as a run blocker and be a kind of uh, go get it red zone slash third down possession tight end type smash and cash. Uh, I think he could maybe, maybe be that, uh, but uh, on the offensive line, one big saving grace, and honestly, someone I thought about making the star of the season, but I don't know that he was necessarily like great at his position, kind of like Ty J Spears was. But uh, Dylan Radins, former second round pick here in, I think this is year three for him. Um, it's just been a disaster for him. He, he had kind of been dubbed a bust coming into the year. They had moved him into guard, and it just wasn't working. Um, but about that week 11 mark after Hubbard went down for the season, Raiden stepped back into right tackle after having to play some left, and he plays pretty well at right tackle. He even had a start earlier in the season that he held up well at right tackle. Um, then they saw that, and they're like, oh, you know, maybe he can play left, and he can't. He got destroyed at left tackle, but at right tackle, he actually finished as a very solid level right tackle for about the last two months of the season. He's got the athleticism. He's got the draft pedigree. If he ends up their right tackle next year, because they have a million needs to focus on this year, I think he's got a chance to kind of have one of these. I mean, how similar is this to Luke Gedeke, uh th that we've talked about for for the Bucks, where, you know, kind of a lighter dude, pigeonholed into guard. And, man, this is a tangent, but we've got to stop just saying, oh, this guy's undersized. He's got to be a guard. It, again, it just doesn't really always work that way. A guy like Raiden's, Maybe his lack of play strength means he should be a tackle uh, because they're about 50 pounds lighter out there on the edge than they are on the inside. So, um, you know, I don't think he's cemented himself as their you know right tackle next year in the way that Luke uh, Gadecki has for the Bucks. But uh, there's definitely a chance that that he could um, surprise next year. Um, and then this Andrew Rupchich out of Colgate University. Never heard of the dude, but uh, did get four starts at the end of the year, graded out all right, so give him a little bit of love. Uh, I don't think there's a starter there or anything, but you never know, I guess. Um, let's talk about Mike Vrabel's defense, the former Mike Vrabel here in Tennessee. Definitely going to be a massive overhaul in Tennessee. Scheme, player turnover, um... A long offseason ahead trying to fix this defense that has really just run out of talent. And uh, we'll see some guys dropping in the ratings here. So Tire Tart is where we're going to start here. And he actually was released mid-season. That was one of the most surprising mid-season releases I've seen in a while. Because, you know, prepping for the deep dives and getting through Titans film... Um, and just watching them live, like, this guy has been a player for the Titans. I think when I had James Foster on for the Titans deep dive, we were saying he's the he's the team's, like, unsung hero. And he really had been. Um, not so much this year, man. Just not an impact at all for Tennessee to the point that they really saw him as a, as a replaceable rotational defensive tackle and said, uh, we're, we're just going to move on from, from you. He ended up getting picked up by the Texans, uh, played in a few games at the end of the year, didn't make too much of an impact. Um, so this, uh, I guess, applies as well for the team we just did, uh, the Houston Texans. But, yeah, surprising fall off for him. Then you got Rashad Weaver. You know, he had a good year last year, not a great year, uh, but just has not followed it up with any level of just anything, really. He has not been an impact against the run with his big frame. He has just seven pressures on uh, well over 100 pass rush snaps. Uh, really just... A guy out there and and i am curious if this team does switch like if they happen to switch to like a four three front i really like rashad weaver more with his hand in the dirt than i do with him as like a stand-up edge like they've been doing in tennessee here so keep an eye on that i guess i'm not done with him but man he had an inefficient season um then we get to these linebackers aziz al shair had a really nice year in tennessee um if if They've been doing anything good lately. It's it's getting these linebackers to crank out good seasons, and uh, they picked up Aziz Al Shair from San Francisco, who was their LB three, obviously next to Fred Warner and uh, Dre Greenlaw. But he's been a starter from the get go for Tennessee. Finishes tenth in the NFL in defensive stops. A very solid season as a run defender. Okay in pass coverage. Nothing special there. 
Uh, some good plays, though, with him like running up the seam in cover two. He's the athlete and the cover linebacker here between these two guys, him and Jack Gibbons. And yeah, he's he's just kind of lived up to that contract and been a solid player. Um, and then Jack Gibbons uh, was, you know, kind of named the starter here and has uh, from the beginning of the season and has just not looked back. I mean, he's a thumper of a run defender, a uh, really surprising NFL career so far for me as a Gophers fan to see Jack Gibbons, who was I, I did not see as a NFL caliber player. He's just not the most spectacular athlete. He wasn't even all that big of an impact player for uh, the Golden Gophers, but um, Mike Vrabel saw something in him, and uh, clearly there's something there. I mean, he he flies to the ball. He's physical in run defense. He's got a lot of size and a good mind for the game. So good good on you, Jack Gibbons. I think this is. Uh, a position group that the Titans probably don't have to think too much about, um, you know, as they look at this offseason with a million other needs. Um, then with the cornerback room, a lot of movement here. This group is going to look a lot different next season, I think. So first off, this Eric Garrar, a undrafted rookie, got on the field in the last month of the year and uh, last two months of the, of the year, really. And, uh, you know, solid performance for an undrafted rookie nothing special wasn't making too many big plays or anything but was was out there and not getting picked on too much so give him a little bit of love for climbing into into the lineup in his undrafted rookie year undersized uh kind of um twitchy type on the outside as a kind of under like uh, think of the darius williams mold type of corner is, is kind of how he's been playing out there um, but roger mccreary is really settling in as as a good NFL corner. Not locked down, not dominant, but um, you know he definitely was viewed as a high floor player coming in, and it's, he's kind of just lived up to that. He's very sticky in coverage. I think he's developed his zone instincts quite a bit, and that's helped him um, be a little bit more consistent in terms of not giving up big plays and all that, being in the right place at the right time. Just yeah, settling in as a guy that can play inside and out. He's played a lot of slot for them. Uh, decent enough run defender in the middle there. Just a very useful corner uh, and and has lived up to his draft pedigree for sure. Um, now, these two corners, Christian Fulton and Sean Murphy Bunting, are going to come down. And what a weird season it's been for Christian Fulton, especially in terms of this series. So we lowered him after the first month or so where he looked brutal, uh, just giving up huge chunks of yards week in, week out. I lowered him. And then he came back not long after that and had the two best games of his season there. I think like week six, week seven, some really nice pass breakups, kind of locked down, gave him the, the one ratings point that we had taken away back in the last episode of Studs and Duds. Uh, but since then, which was like week nine, woof, man, Christian Fulton has had a brutal season. Uh, really snap in, snap out has been one of the just least efficient cover corners has given up a ton of yards a bunch of touchdowns um to follow up what was not a good year last year a good start to his career christian fulton but uh, i think certainly christian fulton will be looking for uh, new horizons next year this was year four of that rookie contract and the worst year of his career so we'll, we'll see where he lands he definitely deserves another opportunity and, and he's he's shown flashes in years past uh but yeah he's he's got a long road ahead of him and then Sean Murphy Bunting, another guy that started, I thought, really strong for this Titans team, but just, again, really fell off. I think the lack of pass rush in general in Tennessee really hurt these corners on the back end and made things tough. Um, but for a you know a physical, in-your-face corner like Sean Murphy Bunting, uh, if you're not getting after the quarterback like maybe some of those Bucks teams were when he was uh, at his best, you know, having a cover for three or four seconds sometimes can, can leave some of these aggressive guys uh, just trailing out there or, or gambling in zone coverage and being out of position but yeah sean murphy bunting um shout out to titans fans i made a kind of cornerback tier maker video several weeks back and titans fans were like you need to take another look at sean murphy bunting he's really struggled and um you know i paid a little extra attention to him at, from that point on and he did not finish the year strong and then you look back at kind of the year he's had and um other than the first couple weeks it really has been a uh, kind of a, a flop of a signing, really. So he's going to hit free agency again. It's a player that I thought was going to come to Tennessee and Mike Vrabel's defense and have kind of a huge prove-it year on that one-year contract. But uh, the, the NFL was certainly right about Sean Murphy bunting, kind of letting him sit there and get get a one-year deal. 
uh, really not a special player, uh, certainly not this year at least. Um, but uh, they do pick up Kayvon Wallace, the safety from Arizona and Philadelphia. Fascinating story here. You know, Wallace really just never got his opportunity in Philadelphia, but obviously Jonathan Gannon liked him. So Wallace followed Gannon to Arizona, but he didn't like him that much because then they released him like six weeks later. So uh, I guess Jonathan Gannon just couldn't make up his mind on Kayvon Wallace, but I thought he had played really well in Arizona when they cut him. I think we even talked about it being kind of a weird decision by the Cardinals, uh, but the Titans liked what they saw. They picked him up, and he's playing by far now the best football of his career. He ends up coming in and starting – you know, maybe a month after they had picked him up uh, and after they had traded away Kevin Bayard at the trade deadline and they needed to cover safety on the back end. And he's been that he's been an ultra consistent tackler. I would argue Kayvon Wallace has shown enough this year between his time in Arizona and what he's shown in Tennessee here to be viewed as a starter next year. This was a fourth round pick out of Clemson that really his big knock was tackling consistency. And in his time in Tennessee, he's been coming downfield and, and just not missing tackles really at all. He missed two tackles to a total of 36. Um, that'll play, man. That's, you know, 4.5% missed tackle percentage. It's really good. So I like what we saw from Kayvon Wallace. We'll see if he's, he's starting next year, maybe next to um, Hooker back there. And that is going to do it for today's division. Thank you so much for watching. If you could, please hit that like button on the way out. It does help me out. Let me know in the comments down below where you agree, which players do you disagree or think I omitted from your favorite teams. Let me know all of it in the, uh, in the comments down below. Uh, but until next time, peace out. Peace out.